and welcome to Conversations here on North Metro TV. I'm Rusty Ray. Thank you for joining us where we try to highlight events and people across the North Metro and maybe promote things that are coming up or covering events as they happen. And today we're proud to be joined by Jill Johnson, president, founder of Jill Johnson Consulting. Sir, Johnson Consulting Services. There we go. Yeah. And, and yeah. tell me, that's a big idea for big companies or it's relative to or related to a lot of companies? It's related to a lot of companies. We sort we work exclusively in the service sector. So that encompasses government agencies, not-for-profits, trade associations, and, and professional services. But we also do an awful lot of work in the healthcare industry, mostly on the provider side, helping them understand the things that shift and impact and hit revenues. And so that's our sweet spot. You're talking about decisions being made in boardrooms and high <laughs> corner offices, or are you talking about you know things that are on the ground with with employees worldwide what, what kind of decisions are we talking about well here? a lot of them are really strategic direction so we work with very large enterprises Mayo Clinic has been a long-standing client we work with very sophisticated entrepreneurs who may have a portfolio of businesses that were involved in one probably the smallest that we're actively working with at this stage is the million to 20 million range mm -hmm. but you know over the years I've worked with hypnotherapists and chimney sweep so I've worked with all different kinds of businesses. Are, are there same things that are applicable on that level that are applicable on the 20 million dollar company level or, or is it is it a matter of making a decision is it a matter of looking ahead and making specific goals what are you trying to help folks with? Well I think a lot of it is the the businesses no matter what their sense and scale is really need to understand their their customer and how they can deliver product or service that meets the customer's need all too often especially for an entrepreneur they're a little bit more focused on what they want to do what their passion is and then they're hoping that there will be a market of people who will buy it and so it's a really it's a different shift and a different spin for most people when you have to get them off of the I know you really like doing that but if nobody will pay you for it it's not a business and so helping people understand the difference and then as you move into bigger scale then you're looking at more complex markets bigger geography a lot of competition and so there there are a wide variety of variables that have to go into that evaluation but even the little guy has to be paying attention and be mindful of those things if they want to survive. You step into any of these co-working spaces in the North Loop or a coffee shop in Woodbury yep. or somewhere like that and you're going to find people who have these ideas mm -hmm. and many of them may fizzle out, many of them may kind of stagnate f for a couple of years and then something happens and they're yeah. able to capitalize. What is it you think that are keeping entrepreneurs on any scale mm -hmm. from getting to that what you call levels of success? Well I think part of it has to do is they just not approaching it as a disciplined business and so we see a lot of people who you know I, I love co-working spaces I think they're amazing mm -hmm. especially because you can do a lot of collaborating with other people um, but you can also be very distracted because things aren't going well so I'm gonna go talk to Joe by the coffee maker because I don't want to admit things aren't working and I think the difference for um, organizations that do well is they face their tough problems head on. They're honest with themselves about how well they're doing or not. If things aren't working, then they're like, well, what else can I do? How can I circle back to clients that I've worked with previously to showcase the new things that we do and offer? Is it time for me to level up and and look for um, some new clients? And, you know, I look back um, over, the, I've had my business for over three decades. And so the I came out of the sophisticated um, CPA consulting arena, so I had the business um, analytical skill set. But what I didn't have because I was very young was the was the perceived maturity and the network. And so some of the clients that we worked with when I was employed as a consultant were bigger and had more scale. But then I had to start over again with smaller businesses and, and a variety of different kinds of clients. And you know, it's a level up over time that you move from one phase of client to the next phase to the next. And people who are successful and sustain their, their about business over that long term are looking for ways that they can can find to to either grow or expand or many people are still looking for a lifestyle business and there is nothing wrong with that if you want to have a business that is sustainable for you your family um, for you or a handful of employees 
that often is can be equally as financially successful or frankly more so mm -hmm. than somebody who's got 50 or 100 people and I've got reasons for that that I'd be happy to share with I'm you. I'm sure you would and we, we will I want to get to that but I also want to talk yeah. real quick because I think the ingredient that we haven't used the word yet but I know it's a word you talk a lot about and that's confidence. Yes. You wrote about confidence uh, and last yes. year your book came out compounding your confidence uh, reading through some of that you come right off as confident from an early age and you, you shared even some anecdotes and some stories but the confidence uh, making decisions either as a, as a whole as a group a board or, or a company or these individual entrepreneurs who are trying to start something or are trying to get to that next level mm -hmm. confidence is is it the thing the only thing or is it the where you start well it's 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 intertwined between that and preparation and so we talk in the book about the three le three levels that you go through to to maintain and build confidence and confidence shifts and changes over time mm -hmm. you might be supremely confident in one area of your life or one aspect of business and then that shifts over time so we talk about it from the perspective of progressions so where are you are are you now within that framework of your knowledge and your skill set. The second is practice. What are the opportunities that you create for yourself so that you can develop a level of mastery and which will then move you to an, a new level. And then the third component is presentation. And you know how you hold yourself body-wise, how confidently you present your ideas and information. And what happens a lot of time for people, especially in the business world, um, when they're struggling with decisions, is because they don't trust the information that they have. They know that they don't know enough to make the decision. So they've got uh, imperfect information, and they're struggling because they know this isn't quite what they mm. need and so they aren't confident that they understand enough of what the ramifications of the outcome of the decision will be so a lot of times I get brought in because there is a lack of confidence at the board level or the executive level or the ownership level mm. and they need that outside stimulus because I can be a cattle prod um, but I do supreme research and due diligence. And so we often are bringing in that detailed insight that they don't have the skill, the expertise, or the ability to understand. Um, big data, uh, data sets are complicated. Right. We do a lot of data mining of our clients' revenue streams so that we can really help them understand, look, that is a loser. I just wrote an article called Profit Per Sale. And, and it's gotten a lot of really interesting mm -hmm. traction because nobody writes like that. And I talk about not all clients are worth having. And you need to discern whether or yep. not that client is, is really a good client, a good fit, and good for your long-term health. Because some of those energy vampire clients really are more detrimental hmm. than would be successful for you. Tough to admit sometimes when you're oh, looking only at terrible, the bottom line or, or something terrible. like that. And the problem is, is most people don't realize when they get into it that some those energy vampire that might be the big client actually is so not profitable. Yeah. If they let them go and focused in on the profitable clients, they'd actually have a better book of business. Sounds like it. <laughs> so w the reason we brought you to talk today is because you're bringing these ideas and you're going to offer a couple of classes at uh, mm -hmm. Anoka County Libraries uh, for folks who may be in a position where maybe they're looking at something new or maybe they have a business or maybe they want, they have that idea mm -hmm. and they They've think, how do I yep. take some steps? And so you're offering something called Enduring Entrepreneurs yep. and you have what you call eight enduring traits. Yes. And this goes beyond what we were already talking yes, about. Yes, absolutely. And that's what you're going to be presenting to folks mm -hmm. uh, for free who want to come to the library mm -hmm. and hear this, and yep. we'll give that information here in just a moment. But these enduring traits, you, I don't know if you want to give all of them away. Or you want to I talk about want one to give them all away. You've got to come to get all yeah, eight. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but a couple of them to kind yeah. of tell us kind of which sure. direction you're looking at. Well, I think, you know, part of it is I'm a student of business. So, you know, I've got a master's degree in business. Mm -hmm. I, I've been a management consultant for longer than I want to admit. And I'm a child of entrepreneurs. And so I grew up in a family-owned business that's now 65 years old, has been through three mm -hmm. transitions within the family ownership structure. And, and I'm in the Minnesota Women Business Owners Hall of Fame, and I've studied what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur that builds a business that lasts more than two or three years. And the characteristics that, that began to emerge as, as we were doing all of this, the studying, especially for Hall of Fame, as I was researching future women candidates to be mm -hmm. considered, the, the aspects of what it takes, 
they're pretty comparable to all of them. And so one of the most important pieces is, is to understand that market and to be able to adapt because markets shift and change. It was for me when I th when I think back when I started my career, we didn't have P you know PCs had just come out. My first right. fax machine cost me a thousand dollars. I know that's just frightening. It was probably as big um, as this chair too. It was pretty a much a lot of different you know? technology, right? And right. so so we didn't have the technology. We didn't have access to information the same way. So I've had to adapt and adjust and recalibrate how I do and research what I do for clients and, and then taking it to the next level. Our family business was a small auto body repair shop. Think about what cars were like in 1954 versus the vehicles that, that you see yeah. today. And so to be able to, to recalibrate and adapt constantly to that evolving marketplace is an absolute fundamental key, but people don't understand how you gather information and, and go through things like that. I, I took a peek at the list. I want to yes. ask you about okay. one specific yep. one, and the yep. realistic vision. I think <laughs> when you think entrepreneur, when you think about, I yeah. want to start this business, or you, you sit mm -hmm. around and you daydream or something like that, it's possible to daydream and have a realistic vision at the same time, I would imagine? Yes and no. Okay. I, I think a lot of times, you know, I always, when I when I talk with people, especially people who are looking to build a business of scale, some lo that's their mm -hmm. long-term vision, they're focused on their exit strategy. And I had a guy one day that was, you know, he was like, oh, those are going to be national and we're going to have all these franchises and it's going to be so great and I'm going to make so much money when I when I get done and I said well you know what would be really helpful is if we started with one and focused on proof of concept mm -hmm. um, rather than looking at and spending the money that you think you're going to cash out on and he never was able to successfully do a mm -hmm. proof of concept because he missed so many of the elements about what his customer needed and wanted he was simply looking at okay I think I can create something and then there will be big zeros after it and so real so entrepreneurs that have that realistic vision understand how big their market potential really is. And, and that's where some of that additional business research and discipline start to come into play. We, we use and buy demographic data for our clients all the time. So we're actually quantifying market potential for them. And then we're looking at projections over five years. How is that going to shift and change? We might look at sub-age cohorts mm -hmm. to see over a longer term, how is that shifting and changing? You look at, at the community of Blaine, for example, it's different than it was when my friend moved out here 25 years ago. I mean, it's, I always have to stop and remember this exit is very different. It's yes. the exit to her house, and I drove past it the first time after the construction was done. So, so having that big vision, you still have to match your skill, your drive, your cash flow, all of those things have to be calibrated back into it. And most people are just so focused on the vision, they can't break down all the components to how do we start from one mm -hmm. level to the next to the next to reach that. I have a great slide that I use. You know, people always think success is really easy. You start here and you end there and it's a straight line. It's not. <laughs> Anybody who is a sailor will understand you go off this way and then you make a course correction and you tack back and so forth. And eventually you get to your goal. Successful entrepreneurs are able to make those course corrections before they do serious damage to the enterprise or to their cash. I would imagine a lot of people are looking out and you know the political discussion right now is some of it is about well the economy is really good and some people are taking credit for that and some people are mm -hmm. pointing out indicators but then some especially in the past uh, month or so two months have said oh there are some indications that the mm -hmm. economy could change it cycles and goes through things we've, right. we've been through the downturn 12 years ago or whatever but are people looking at that reasonably trying to make these <laughs> kinds of decisions or are entrepreneurs just like let's go get it no matter what and we'll see what happens well here's the thing one of the other eight is financial discipline. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is is that you know there's optimal times to start but you can start a business anytime you want. But you need to make sure do I have enough cash reserves if the worst happens. Right. And so a lot of the reason that you see companies going out of business during a, an economic downturn is because they simply don't have the cash reserves to be able to weather the storm. I think I've been through, I don't know, four to seven right. recessions over the years. And it's sometimes, it's dismal. It's, you know, it can be feast or famine. But I, oh, I, I don't live on my income. I have a lot of uh, mm -hmm. savings set aside so that I don't have to give up my, my dream of being a business owner Okay. because I didn't have enough cash. I was talking with somebody the other day, um, it's a service pro service provider, and 
you know, I was whining about, you know, the tax, pa taxes were due, and I always tell my husband, don't ever ask me for money when it's close to tax payment time. And she said, oh, well, I haven't paid any of my taxes this year. And I looked at her, and I said, well, why not? She said, oh, well, you know, we've done an extension, and, you know, I still haven't paid off my taxes from last year. She made over $200,000 in income as a solo practitioner. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, are you nuts? And then she's like, well, and then I've got education debt, $40,000 of education debt, and then she's got a car debt, and now she's got some medical debt. You know, people like that, I mean, I worry for her about her ability right. to sustain without having to go back into the corporate world because she's got no cushion and there's no other reserve there for her. Now, she's terrific at what she does, but that's not enough. To be successful and to build a business that endures, you absolutely have to have some financial savvy behind you. Absolutely, okay, and those are three of the eight traits she <laughs> wants to cover, and those dates are uh, Monday, November 4th from 6.30 to 7.30, that's at the Rum River Library Branch in Anoka, and then Monday, December 9th, 6.30 to 7.30 at the Northtown Branch in Blaine. Jill Johnson will be there to share these and other tips and uh, some anecdotes and just to Lots. help get people thinking about what they might need if they want to take these steps or, or continue their journey. If you are even anywhere in that entrepreneurial space or idea, small business, entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it, there will be something for everybody who comes to, to the library events. Okay, we look forward to it. Jill, thank you so much. Thank you so much.